In this video, we'll be drawing this. Woohoo, let's get to work. For the autonomic nervous system, we are going to use a black, red, and blue marker. You might want to use skinny markers because it's just one sheet of paper and we have to fit a lot of details on there. On the left hand side in the upper corner, you're going to write sympathetic. And on the right hand side, you're going to write parasympathetic. And in the center, you're going to write target organs or target structures, target organ systems. And we're going to list out all of the, not all of them, that's not an exhaustive list, but kind of just a decent list to, give you, list to give you an idea of the types of structures that are targeted by the autonomic nervous system. All of these things are going to have receptors, <laughs> receptors for certain neurotransmitters, which we are going to be discussing in another video. But for now, I want you to get the, used to the idea that these are your targets. They're going to be receiving information from the nervous system about things that they're supposed to do. If you go all the way back to the homeostatic feedback loop in chapter one of semester one, you may recall that part of that was a response or an effector. So an effector mediates a response to a homeostatic imbalance or some kind of a stimulus that comes along. These are the effectors. These are the responders. Now, you, this is really going back and taking you through it, but there's only two things that a, an effector will do. It either has a muscle contraction or it has a glandular secretion. You remember that stuff? Do you remember that information? So for example, if we go down the list here, heart, sweat glands, blood vessels, adrenal medulla, abdominal organs, bladder, genitals, it's, you know, it's not super detailed here, especially like abdominal organs, that's a pretty big category. So <laughs> there's always a choice about how much detail to go into. Okay, so let's take a look at adrenal medulla. Now the adrenal medulla secretes a substance called adrenaline. You've probably heard of that before. Adrenaline. It's secreted by the adrenal medulla. That's how it gets its name. It's also called epinephrine. And when it secretes it, as you probably know, adrenaline or epinephrine has huge effects on your body. The things that adrenaline is known for are things like speeding up your heart rate, um, increasing your blood pressure, increasing your respiratory rate, for example. So this right away should give you a clue of the power of the autonomic nervous system, the ability to secrete large quantities of adrenaline directly into your bloodstream. So there's the secretion story. As far as the muscle contraction story, let's look one above that to the blood vessels. Now the blood vessels have walls, um, you know, they're tubes with walls. And in the walls of the blood vessels, especially in the walls of arteries, we'll talk lots and lots about these details down the line, but I want you to understand that there's walls that have muscles in them. It's smooth muscle. And this smooth muscle can be targets of the autonomic nervous system and can cause muscle contractions of these smooth muscles in the walls of these blood vessels. And it's called a vasoconstriction. When you vasoconstrict a blood vessel, you tighten it up. In other words, not as much blood can pass through it. It's called a vasoconstriction. So there's a target from the autonomic nervous system to blood vessels that allows for a muscle contraction that's very powerful. It basically decides where in the body you're going to disperse blood, where you're going to distribute blood to. That's extremely powerful. And the autonomic nervous system is in charge of that. And so therefore the blood vessels are one of the targets here of the autonomic nervous system. So these are two examples of things like general categories of things that can happen when the autonomic nervous system is involved. You can have a muscle contraction or you can have a secretion of a substance. So now that we've considered kind of the end result of the autonomic nervous system, let us get into the details of the way in which the central nervous system interacts to cause these things to happen, to cause these effectors to contract their muscles or to secrete their substances. Okay looks kind of curved from this angle, but that's a spinal cord. <laughs> and up at the top is kind of a rudimentary depiction of the brainstem. There's two structures in the brainstem we're going to be uh, 
drawing and the midbrain and the medulla oblongata. Just go ahead and label those. Of course, in between there, you do have the pons, but that is not as important for our story today. I'm also going to go ahead and label the categories of nerves uh, and the spinal cord, the cervical nerve, the thoracic nerve, <clears throat> the lumbar nerves. Remember all them? And you also remember at the bottom there is the sacral nerves down towards the more, you know, inferior end of the spinal cord. We're going to go ahead and draw the sacral nerves here. And there's five of them, so go ahead and draw six lines because each of those little boxes kind of represents one nerve. The ones that are important to us today are S2, S3, and S4. Since the parasympathetic nervous system commences from the brainstem and the sacral nerves, it is considered to be the craniosacral branch of the autonomic nervous system. On the left-hand side, we're going to draw another spinal cord. Uh, just so we're completely clear, your body does not have two spinal cords. <laughs> we're simply duplicating it on the left side for the sake of simplicity. Again, this is my favorite way to depict the autonomic nervous system is where the target organs are in the center and then you draw kind of two versions of the central nervous system on either side because this kind of tells the story in the way that I want to tell the story. So there's going to be a lot of details to this, right? But you want to put the target organs in the center because kind of you want to think about the end result of this. On the sympathetic side, we do not involve the brain here. We are only interested in the spinal cord. So we're going to draw the thoracic region and a portion of the lumbar region. We're going to go ahead and draw 12 thoracic nerves and then only the top two lumbars. The sympathetic nervous system is considered the thoracolumbar nervous system. Thoracolumbar. It's all the thoracic nerves, T1 through T12 plus L1 and L2. Remember that on the parasympathetic side, it is considered the craniosacral branch. And on the sympathetic side, it is called the thoracolumbar branch. Next, what we're going to draw is something that you've probably not given a lot of thought to before. It's called a sympathetic trunk. Go ahead and do a Google Images search on the sympathetic trunk. There's one on either side of the spinal cord. So we'll go ahead and draw both of those here. What the sympathetic trunk is is basically a long ganglion, an elongated ganglion. We'll go ahead and label those. We're going to draw it out for the one on the, I guess, the right sympathetic trunk. But for the left sympathetic trunk, remember everything is reversed left and right, we will just abbreviate it. You want to keep your words and all the details as small as possible. Uh, just kind of do what I'm doing, it'll be fine. The next thing that we're going to draw are two substantial ganglia on the sympathetic side and three on the parasympathetic side. You'll notice that they're sort of in between the central nervous system and the target organs. What a ganglion is, is a place where a synapse occurs. So the next thing that we're going to draw is a representative neuron that is leaving the central nervous system, synapsing inside of a ganglion, or synapsing inside of the sympathetic trunk, and then making a, another interaction with the target organs. So that is the point of the ganglia, a point where these synapses can occur. We're going to go ahead and start drawing representative neurons. You'll notice that there is one little circle, and we're using blue for this, one circle inside of the midbrain and then three inside of the medulla oblongata. And you'll notice, please do notice where the synapses occur. The little blue dot is inside of the brainstem or inside of the sacral nerves, and that represents the cell body and dendrites, anything like that. And then the line that we're drawing there is an axon that takes information from that cell body and carries it to a synapse. And you notice the synapse is sort of this little V or Y shape there. Now notice the presentation of the Ys. Three of them land right inside of those representative ganglia. And some of them do not have ganglia. That's just simply a synapse that appears to be uh, sort of floating in space. Sticking with our blue marker, we're going to go over to the left side, to the sympathetic side, and we are going to draw dots or cell bodies inside of each of the boxes. Go ahead and just put little blue dots inside of each of those. The blue color does matter. Uh, it doesn't have to be blue. Of course, it could be green or it's like maybe some co cool color like that, but something like that. And uh, go ahead and draw your cell bodies in each of these nerves. 
the next thing we're going to do is draw axons. Now, I always have to pick and choose with this kind of a lesson the amount of detail that I want to go into. So what I've chosen is not to go into specific detail about the types of nerves that are leaving. There's, there's specific names for all of these, and I, I don't necessarily think that's very important information, but some people are super detailed anatomists, and you can certainly get to know that information. I have no problem with that at all. You could get to know the splanchnic nerve on the sympathetic side, or of course the vagus nerve on the parasympathetic side, or the names of all the ganglia, celiac ganglia, the ganglion, for example. So yes, all the ganglia have <laughs> names as well, and this is not an exhaustive list of the ganglia. There's plenty that are not actually pictured. We're basically just drawing a representation and examples of each of these things. And we're going to go ahead and draw. We're going to go ahead and skip down to T, sorry, L1 and L2, representative neurons that leave out of the spinal cord, and they actually skip right through. And you notice there's no synapse in the synaptic trunk, in the sympathetic trunk. Instead, the synapses are directly in that ganglion. You'll notice they kind of pass right through. So generally speaking, on the sympathetic side, everything at least passes through the sympathetic trunk. We're now going to go down to T5, 6, 7, and 8, and we're going to draw representative neurons that are going to pass through this ganglion. There's going to be one synapse made inside of this ganglion, but then there's going to be the passage. This is a little bit, I, don't, I feel like I depicted this poorly, but anyway, there's going to be one direct path directly to that very special adrenal medulla, super special. There's a direct connection between the spinal cord and the adrenal medulla. This is the only direct connection that there is. In the autonomic nervous system, everything passes through two neurons, two neurons in a row. But for the adrenal medulla, it's special. There's only one. So let's go ahead and take a look over at the parasympathetic side. We're going to go ahead and draw another set of cell bodies. There will be little dendrites there too, but we don't need to go into that level of detail. And for each of those, um, for each of those uh, axon terminals there, we're going to draw a cell body that's going to be receiving information from the first neuron in line. The first neuron in line is called the preganglionic neuron. The second neuron in line is called the postganglionic neuron. And you can see why, because in general terms, the synapses are occurring inside of a ganglion. I'll be darned if I didn't skip over that ganglion. The ganglion third one down, you'll notice there is no postganglionic neuron, just a cell body. Go ahead and draw an axon from there directly to the salivary glands. The salivary glands receive innervation from both the second and third ganglion that are shown here. One of the characteristics of the parasympathetic nervous system is that the preganglionic neurons are quite long, the postganglionic neurons are quite short, um, and even the ones that do not appear to have a ganglion, there will be a small ganglion that very, very, very close to the target organ. On the sympathetic side, we're going to draw one cell body in blue, only one. There is one postganglionic neuron that goes directly from the sympathetic trunk to the sweat glands and is blue or green or whatever cool color you're using. But the rest of them, go ahead and draw red. This is the first time we're using red. <clears throat> and there's a specific reason for that, which we'll get into in the next video. So go ahead and draw red cell bodies for everything else that you see. Every time you see a synapse, go ahead and draw a red cell body. The preganglionic neurons on the sympathetic side are blue. The postganglionic neurons are mostly red, with the exception of the one leading to the sweat glands, which is still blue. One of the things you'll notice is that many of these, uh, many of these target organs have innervation from both sides, both from the parasympathetic side and from the sympathetic side. This is called dual innervation, D-U-A-L, dual innervation, which in some cases is antagonistic, as is the case with the heart, where the sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, nervous systems have opposite or antagonistic purposes. But sometimes it's actually what we call cooperative effect. So dual innervation can actually be cooperative. This would be the case, for example, with the genitals, where both the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems are involved with 
uh, copulation and sexual excitement. It's not completely in, clear in the picture here, but the sympathetic trunk and the ganglia on the sympathetic side are all very, very close to the spinal cord. So the preganglionic neurons, the preganglionic fibers on the sympathetic side tend to be quite short, and the postganglionic neurons tend to be quite long. So it's quite the opposite of the parasympathetic side where the preganglionic neurons are very long, postganglionic neurons are quite short. On the sympathetic side, again, the preganglionic neurons are very short, oftentimes making synapses a very close to the spinal cord, for example, in the sympathetic trunk, which is right there next to the spinal cord. And then the postganglionic neurons tend to be quite a bit longer. Two more things of note as we look at this picture. You will see that there are three target structures or groups of target structures that only receive input from one side. I want you to ask yourself, what are the three inputs that don't receive dual innervation? And which branch do they not receive information from? Or which branch do they receive information from? I want you to have that in your mind. <clears throat> Additionally, I would like to say just kind of as an introduction to the next video because it is it's an esoteric concept that cannot be repeated enough, I think. <laughs> The red and blue colors are significant. The blue color, every time you see a blue neuron, it indicates a neuron or a representative neuron. Remember, this is representing you know hundreds of neurons in each case, or more than that. Um, so every time you see a blue, that means that is a cholinergic neuron that produces and communicates with acetylcholine. Therefore, it's cholinergic, cholinergic. When you see the red, this is what we call an adrenergic neuron, which produces and communicates with norepinephrine and epinephrine, norepinephrine primarily. So we have adrenergic neurons that are red and cholinergic neurons that are blue or green, whatever color you used. And as we move on into the next video, I want you to keep that in mind. So kind of take a look at it right now and familiarize yourself with well, which of these is cholinergic? Which of these is adrenergic? What does that mean? And then you'll be better prepared for the next video that gets to be um, a little more detailed about that stuff. <laughs>